and welcome to Hunting Illinois podcast. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some archery equipment. Um, so it's August, uh, late August now, and we're getting into the season here. So we're going to go over kind of a gear guide on um, what type of archery, archery equipment you're going to be looking for and uh, kind of pros and cons of the different types of bows you can be using in Illinois and uh, just all around 101 on archery equipment uh, to get started here. And uh, I'm sure we'll have some other archery themed uh, podcast here coming up over the past over the next month probably going more into the strategy and things like that but today we're gonna be focusing more on that gear and uh, with me today we have Dan Stevens hello everybody and Curtis Twelman hello hello and then uh, before we get started with uh, talking about gear and everything else uh, let's go over some updates with the program and then maybe some uh, updates with outdoor news and things like that so Dan uh, what's going on with the program right now yeah, so we've got, you know, obviously hunting season is, is rapidly approaching like you, you just kind of mentioned. So we're, we're getting geared up. We've got a, a few events, you know, on the, on the docket that are coming down the pipeline. We've got plenty more that are, you know, still in that, that planning process that we hope to, to finalize in the, the, the coming days slash weeks ahead. Uh, so just kind of stay tuned to all of our social media for, for any relevant updates. And a, a good, you know, kind of reminder is we do have a, a monthly newsletter um, so if you're not an individual who likes to spend a lot of time on social media, you can certainly follow that that monthly newsletter and you'll get a nice kind of little monthly snapshot of of what's going on in terms of Illinois hunting, what's going on in terms of Illinois hunting news. And then, of course, updates about the, the Learn to Hunt program and any of our you know programmatic offerings. Uh, so so definitely check that out. There's a sign up form on our, on our website. You can you know, quickly sign just into that, that newsletter. But we do have a, a couple events coming down that are that are currently scheduled. Um, obviously, since this is, you know, a, a podcast where we're talking about archery, we do have a lot of archery stuff coming down uh, the pipeline. We've recently held um, one kind of archery 3D shoot where we, you know, simulate hunting and, and allow people to, to practice. You know, and in, in a lot of cases in Illinois, it, it's difficult to find ranges that are open and accessible that you can just go shoot. And so this event is kind of designed to help offset that constraint and provide you know, some, some target shooting activities. Uh, we do have one coming up actually tomorrow on August 27th. So if you happen to be, you know, one of the first ones to, to hear this tonight on the 26th, when we release it, if you're in the, the, the St. Louis kind of East St. Louis Metro area, uh, we're doing a, a shoot at Horseshoe Lake state park or Horseshoe Lake state fish and wildlife area. Uh, there is a few spots still left open. So if you are interested, you can still register and, and grab a spot for that. Um, if you're near the, the Champaign area, we're also doing a, a similar type of event. Um, at Middle Fork River Forest Preserve, um, that's in Champaign County, and that's going to be um, on September 10th. Um, there are still quite a few spots available to that, but I anticipate those are going to start filling up pretty quickly in the next uh, couple of days. Um, outside of, of archery, we have a big learn to hunt deer workshop where we kind of talk about the basics of hunting, go over the strategies, go over the equipment necessary, talk about some techniques, um, some game processing stuff. Um, that's held at Des Plaines State Fish and Wildlife on September 24th. Um, currently, there's only two spots remaining. So if you're interested in attending that event on September 24th, uh, try to grab one of those those last few spots. Um, and if you're interested in that event and, and you can't make it or, or the spots are gone by the time you get there, we're going to have a lot more learn to hunt deers in the, the next couple of weeks. So uh, just kind of stay tuned to that. Um, and another big event that we're hosting is called Illinois Hunt Camp 2022. And I'll turn it over to Curtis so he can kind of uh, discuss that event a little bit. Sure. Yeah. So well, Hunt Camp's going to be loads of fun. This is going to be one you're not going to want to miss. This is kind of a whole new um kind of a new framework for a banquet slash outdoor dinner and a lot of us are familiar with the du banquets the pheasants forever banquets and those are great fun those are awesome i'm going to go to them every year hopefully win some stuff um well so yeah we're not trying to like change that but we are trying to make something that's similar but a little bit different and hunt camp is going to be a time for hunters to come together hunters and trappers of all different kinds come together set our differences aside for one night and just have fun you know try to rekindle some of that lost social capital of hunters past maybe we've heard our grandpas talking about the the hunt camps of old days and going to the deer check stations and all these things and and we reminisce about that and and I can't promise that Hunt Camp is going to be a, a perfect recreation of that, but we're going to do our best to, uh, to, to try to recreate some of that magic in Hunt Camp. And 
what it's going to be is October 1st up at the quarry, which is in Crystal Lake, which is uh, kind of the outskirts of Chicago area there. Beautiful venue. They've got volleyball courts on site. They've got uh, bags, cornhole. So we're going to be playing games. We're going to have some tables set up where we can learn some outdoor skills and practice that and talk about it, debate it, whatever, you know. So we're going to have tables set up with, uh, with traps out and we're going to talk about trapping. We're going to have another table set up with knife sharpening supplies out there and we're going to learn how to sharpen knives and just have a bunch of different skills tables out there to get the conversation going. Then there's going to be games. And then the big draw of hunt camp, we think, is going to be the hunt raffle. And this is going to be a completely free raffle. Everybody that signs up for hunt camp gets tickets. They, uh, this one is not a free event. It's a collaborative event. But uh, you can get one single ticket for $15 or a pair uh, for two people coming in the same car, whether you're a couple or hunting buddies or whatever you might be. Um, you can get a pair for 20. So not free for this event, but we do think it's very affordable um, considering food's going to be provided. We're going to be grilling burgers and dogs thanks to the Illinois Conservation Foundation. And we've got so many partners lined up to help with this. Uh, it's going to be a blast. I mean, Pheasants Forever, NWTF, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Fur Takers of America. I already mentioned ICF. We've got the IDNR. Uh, Delta waterfowl. I mean, the list goes on and on. Everybody's going to be represented there. And we're going to try to get a whole bunch of hunts donated. And that's going to be our main prizes for hunt camp. So um, completely free raffle. You get the tickets when you walk in the door. And then if you happen to be a member of Pheasants Forever, Fur Takers, any of these groups, we're going to give you bonus tickets again for free. Or if you decide to sign up right there at the event, we'll give you bonus tickets there too. But you'll be able to go through and see all of these mentored hunts kind of listed out on a card along with what you'll need if you win that hunt, licenses, equipment, and whatnot. And uh, you can decide which hunts you want to try to win by where you put your tickets. And we're hoping to award a bunch of people with really cool mentored hunts at this thing. Uh, we're going to eat some food. There's a bar on site and alcohol is not included, unfortunately, but the quarry does sell drinks all the way up until 11. So we're going to have games, we're going to have food, we're going to have drinks, we're going to have a whole bunch of hunters. What's not to love, man? I'm already getting excited about it. I wish it was October 1st now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and the, the, the cool thing just to, to kind of add on is there's probably going to be a hunt for, for a hunting, you know, style for just about any interest you have. You know, we've already got squirrel hunts lined up. We've got some upland hunts lined up. We've got deer archery hunts lined up. We're going to try to get some more waterfowl and some of these, you know, other, other types of hunting. So it's going to be a real, we got a great yeah, raccoon raccoon. Hunt from Jason yep. guy we went with uh, last year. People are not going to be disappointed in that group at all. No, no. And, in you know, in addition to the hunts, uh, we're also going to to try to get some outdoor experiences, so to speak. So um, even if you're, you know, not necessarily ready to take that step to begin hunting, uh, we're, we're going to try and attempt to have different day passes to different sporting clays courses and things like this that, that you know, if, if you're brand new and you're just not ready to take that next step into hunting, there will be some experiences out there that you can probably win at this event that, that you'll get a lot of a lot of service out of and a lot of a lot of fun and a lot of enjoyment. And, just and then uh, network, you know, so many yeah. of us think about social networking at work and all that, but within the hunting community, just think about the relationships you can form. And um, I, we're all more powerful when we work together. Maybe somebody's got a turkey spot, somebody's got a mm -hmm. duck spot, somebody's got a deer spot. When all your powers combine, you can hunt all year, every species you want to hunt. So <laughs> net, networking is is a big deal too. And we hope that that's going to be at hunt camp in spades. Yeah. And, and I should mention um, that, that some of these hunts will be kind of, you know, a solo hunt where you, one person will win it. Others will be kind of awarded as a group. We may have, you know, a, a pheasant hunt that allows up to five spots. And so, you know, if you and your buddies want to get together and try to, you know, really focus on that hunt and try to get, you know, three or four spots in a hunt like that, it could be a lot of fun. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And then we also were lucky enough to get some corporate sponsors too. So I think Vortex said they're going to be donating some products from them. 
um, which you can also win. Again, that's going to be, I think, a free raffle to get some Vortex equipment, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's going to be just for the people who donate uh, hunts. So, okay. yeah, for the, yeah, for the uh, just the people who donate hunts and mentored hunting opportunities, they're going to have special raffle just for them to win some hunting equipment. And we hope that that's going to be enough incentive that we get a whole bunch of really cool hunts uh, to also give away. So, yeah, and we're taking yeah, if, if yeah, I was about right. I think Dan thought the same thing I did at the same <laughs> bet, time. Yep. Uh, yeah, so we're taking those. So if anyone is listening to this and they actually have some opportunities that they would like to donate and uh, let some people either on your land or take some people out, uh, let us know. There's uh, you can email Curtis and um, we have a form you can fill out and submit that. Yep, Curtis11 at illinois.edu. And um, if you're just interested, I can send you the information about kind of what we're looking for and then uh, sort of the incentive package that we're building to, to get, help get people excited. And I know most people that, that are uh, mentors, you know, they know the mentoring itself is, is enough reward. That's all they need. But we want to try to throw a few cherries on top. So like Jason mentioned, we've got Vortex on board. We've got Hunt Stand on board. And we're building uh, two different things for everybody that donates a hunt. First off, we're going to give everybody that donates a hunt a gift basket with outdoor stuff in there. Um, one of the items is a hunt stand uh, subscription for a year, and that's maps for all 50 states. So really cool. You can start it whenever you want. Everybody's going to get that. Uh, we're going to have a special raffle for everybody that donates a hunt, but also shows up to hunt camp. This is again free, don't have to spend a, a dime for it, free raffle, but we're gonna have Vortex binoculars up there and who knows what else, that list is continuing to grow. So we're definitely gonna try to make it where uh, we show our appreciation in some small way uh, to everybody that's out there mentoring and, and helping teach people and, and sharing their admiration of the outdoors because that's what it's all about. And, that's what hunt camp's all about. So it's it's sure to be fun whether you're on the side where you're an experienced hunter and you you have a hunt to donate, awesome. You're gonna have a blast. Or if you're brand new, never hunted before, you're gonna have a blast for the same reason. So uh, come on out, it's for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we With all your help, it's gonna be a big success. So I'm really excited. Uh, and then, uh, so moving on, I think, Dan, do you have some updates for, um, some outdoor news? Yeah. So it, it's getting that point in, in time, you know, obviously fall is, is I'll, I'll say rapidly approaching, uh, starting to see a lot of, a lot of different species starting to change their behaviors a little bit, which is a, a good sign that the hunting season is around the corner. And, and certainly the news is starting to, to align with that. So, uh, one of the, the first kind of news items I wanted to, to touch on was Ducks Unlimited put out their, uh, 2022, 2023 waterfowl, uh, population assessment is basically a big survey. Um, unfortunately they, I, I believe this is the first one they've been able to do since about 2019, uh, due to the, obviously the, the COVID shutdown and the pandemic that, that hindered a lot of these efforts. Um, not the greatest report we've ever seen. Um, I'll kind of go over some of the numbers, talk a little bit about what it means. And, and the, the Ducks Unlimited chief scientist, uh, Dr. Adair, um, actually gave a, a few concluding thoughts on this on the study. So I'll kind of share those quotes as we wrap up. Uh, but the total populations were estimated at 34.2 million breeding ducks um, in this traditional survey area, which is, again, the, the breeding, breeding areas. Um, unfortunately, that's about 12 percent lower than it was in the, the 2019 um, study, which again, that was the last time they've done it uh, pre-COVID. And Dr. Adair kind of summed it up by uh, saying the total duck estimate in the traditional survey area was the lowest in nearly 20 years. Um, so obviously not the not the greatest news, but it, it, it often makes sense, especially when you correlate it to, to some of the current weather conditions that have impacted these breeding areas. Um, there's been some pretty significant droughts the past few years in, in these areas, and that's really hindering um, some of these breeding populations in those areas. So Unfortunately, not the, the greatest news, uh, but we will have a, a link to the, the full population study um, in, the, in the show notes. And if you're on YouTube in the, the description down below, um, they, they, do, they do a really good job of building kind of visual tables. So if you're not familiar with, with reading some of these more you know, abstract scientific reports, um, this article is kind of put in a nice, easy format. It just goes over the highlights, shows you the data, and you can, you can move on pretty quick. Um, so 
Yeah, and I, I also should say um, this this number, the the thirty four point two million, is also actually four percent below the the long term average. And so, um, in this the survey, they basically have built this long term average since about the nineteen fifties, is I believe when this this survey started. Um, and so we are significantly below that at about four percent. So hopefully we start to see these numbers increase. But again, a lot of it's weather de- weather and climate dependent. So. Uh, we'll just kind of have to have to wait and see. Um, another kind of news item I, I wanted to bring up is Illinois DNR has started to to publish a lot of their proposed administrative rules. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with with administrative rules, they're essentially the rules that hunters have to abide by. Um, that that's what the Illinois DNR Digest is is kind of a, a summary, so to speak. It's not the actual legal language um, that's found in these administrative rules, which is then kind of in essence, summarized in the in the in the digest. So, if you're interested in looking over these proposed administrative rules, um, there are quite a few changes depending on what species, what what hunting uh, style you're you're looking into. Uh, but we'll have a, a link down in the show notes to all these proposed administrative rules. And the the nice thing about these proposals is when they release them, it, it's very easy to see the differences between the you know the the last that was acted on, the last that were you know, basically solidified as as ad rules uh, versus the proposed. So it's really easy to see those differences from year to year. So you can really see what changes they are proposing rather than having to read through, you know, a 15 page document and see if there's any words that are changed. It's pretty easy to, to pick those out. Uh, so those are kind of the, the two news items I wanted to share. But I also do want to share uh, we have a lot of deadlines, um, especially now that we're approaching fall. A lot of the lottery applications are now open. Uh, free Upland game permit. Uh, so this is a free lottery application. If you're interested in hunting, you know, pheasants, quail, um, rabbit in some cases, um, you'll you'll want to look into this, especially on public lands. Um, the, the 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 deadline application is August 31st. So we're we're getting pretty close. So if you're you're interested in submitting an application, go ahead and, and remember to get that in. And again, if you don't hunt, um, you're you're not really losing out on anything. You're only kind of taking away that opportunity from somebody else. So there's really, you know, not a not a big issue uh, to to put in for it. It's free. Um, so give it a shot. Uh, the next one is public duck and goose. Um, that first lottery application is currently open and also closes August 31st. Uh, this first lottery is residents only. Uh, the second lottery will start September 1st, and that can be non-residents as well as individuals who didn't draw on the first lottery. Um, so, so make sure to, to check that out. And we'll have links to all these in the, the show notes in the description below. A um, couple seasons are getting ready to start. Obviously, dove season is kind of the, the big one that opens September 1st. And I don't know about you guys, but obviously with the, some of the, the drought conditions we've seen recently, I was a little worried um, about what this dove season is going to look like. I didn't see a ton of doves, but it, it looks like they're starting to move in in pretty pretty decent numbers. Um, not like we've seen, you know, in past years where you have a, a really productive dove season, but it looks like they're they're starting to to show up a little bit more in bigger numbers. So should be a, a decent opening week. Uh, so obviously, if you're 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 ready to dove hunt, start September first. So send us some pictures and and share the the love because we love eating doves. So if you have any recipes to share, uh, feel free to to pass them along. Uh, last update is September goose. That starts September 1st. And so this is, if you've been through our, our waterfowl, any of our waterfowl classes, we talk about this concept of two populations of Canada geese. There's this migratory population that comes down every every fall and winter. Um, and you, you're, you're typically hunting those during your standard duck and goose season. Uh, the other population is kind of this resident population. So these are the geese you see at parks and you know parking lots and things like that. And that population is really rapidly increasing. And so this early goose season is designed to reduce those population numbers. And so there is an expanded bag limit. So if you really enjoy hunting geese, you really enjoy eating geese, uh, you can get a, a pretty decent bag limit this time of year. So that that season does run from September 1st through the September 15th. Awesome. Yeah. Um, back to the admin rules, Dan, is this the comment time for that or are they already passed? The, the, the comment time is open. Correct. Right. So anyone who likes to complain about different laws that they've seen come through, this is your time to shine. Um, so yep. go through those and, and pick through those and see if there's anything that's been changed. And this is when you can actually be listened to before it's passed. And uh, and so go ahead and this is the time to mail your congressman or as they say. Um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend at least looking through them, seeing what changes are are likely going to come down the pipeline. A lot of the proposals are you know, simplistic stuff like, oh, the, the turkey season dates need to be shifted down a day since they start on Monday. They just have to change the dates from last year to this year. So you'll see a lot of stuff like that. And you'll see, you know, different sites being added to, to being open to hunting 
or removed via, you know, some population metric, whether, you know, turkeys just weren't present on that site last year. They want to rebuild that population. They may remove turkey. So you may see stuff like that as well. Um, sure. But Awesome. All right. Uh, let's get into the meat of the podcast now. Um, so we're about ready to start up some archery here. And I know there's some people at this time of year is kind of when uh, they might get the itch and start thinking about, hey, you know what? This is something I've always wanted to try. Season's coming up. Um, let me go out and try to get some gear. And uh, of course, we recommend that everybody be practicing all year round and be practicing throughout the summer. Make sure they get enough practice. in. if you go pick up some gear in the coming weeks, make sure you're you're uh, really good at shooting before you head out and try to shoot some animals. But um, hey, this is the time to get out. Uh, so with that, um, what are some thoughts that you guys have about people um, who might be going out and trying to get some gear right now? Like what are some considerations that people should make um, as they're looking at gear on the shelf? Sure. I'll kind of take a, take a stab at it first. I, I like to view archery. Obviously archery is kind of this, this short range hunting tool. Um, we're not taking long shots, you know, on everybody is a little bit different. Every piece of equipment's a little bit different, but for the most part, we're talking, you know, 30 to 35 yards is kind of your, your maximum distance. I personally won't shoot any further than, than 30 or 35. I find that to be, you know, about my, my comfortable distance, a lot arrows fly slow and a lot can happen, you know, as you start to push that distance to, to 40 yards or so. But the, the really important thing I want to highlight, especially in, in reference to hunting is, if you're just, you know, really focused on deer hunting, you know, you, deer is, is what you're interested in, whether it's for the food, whether it's for, you know, the, the camaraderie of it or the recreational aspect of it. You're in Illinois, you're probably going to want to pick up archery, regardless if it's something, you know, you've had a desire to, to try before. Because if you look at the totality of, of deer seasons, you know, firearm season, again, it's lottery based. So you if you don't have access to private land, you may draw a permit, you may not. Um, and if you do happen to draw a permit, you may be only able to hunt for three days or five days where archery, I mean, you know, the standard season is about October 1st through mid January. And so you're looking at, you know, a long time, a lot of opportunity. Um, so even if, you know, deer is just really the, the driving force of you want to get into hunting, I highly recommend looking at archery. And many public sites are open to archery hunting with no no special permit, you know, you don't have to draw in, uh, you check your area fact sheets, but a lot of your normal public properties, you can just archery hunt. So I agree. It's the way to go. If people are wanting to get into deer, I don't care what state they're in, forget the gun, get the bow, you get four times the season and you're going to learn more about the animal. A hundred percent. There's something intimate like like you said dan it's a close range even yeah we know there's crossbows out there that people can shoot targets 100 yards no problem targets don't move you know targets mm -hmm. don't breathe yep. and you don't have to answer for a bad shot that you take on a target but you do on a deer so and yes i know your favorite social media person is probably out there shooting stuff with a blow gun at that distance but he's also <laughs> wounding a lot of stuff that's not making the camera so um, when it comes to being an ethical hunter, I don't care if you use the best crossbow that's out there, or if you're a 78 year old, um, guy by the name of Byron Ferguson, using a stick and string and flinging an arrow that you made, uh, archery is a, a short range. And I'm like you, Dan, 30, 35 yards is my max. And honestly, every deer that I've ever killed. And, uh, it's been, quite a few now has been under 25 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, but that's good that's you're learning about the animal you know if, if you go out with a um a firearm even a muzzleloader or a shotgun you just have to get within 150 yards or so of a deer pick a spot in illinois and you're 150 yards from a deer <laughs> probably so that you don't have to know anything to do that I, and not putting it down i I hunt with firearms too, but if you really want the hunting experience and you want to have options with where you go, when you go, archery is the ticket for sure. Definitely. And the, the nice thing about, about modern equipment is, you know, historically when I, when I first started archery hunting, you had to buy a bow every few years, especially as I was a young kid when I first started shooting. I had to buy a bow when I, when I started to grow a little bit. I grew a little bit more, had to buy another bow. A lot of the manufacturers these days have, have really developed and fine-tuned bows that can really adapt to you and, and kind of almost grow with you. Uh, so there's a, a lot of different options out there. But my first recommendation is really to decide what type of bow and what type of hunting you plan on doing. Whether it's, I guess the first question is, 
do you want to use a crossbow like Curtis was talking about or a vertical bow? Um, so that, that would definitely be kind of my, my first question I would, I would certainly ask myself. Mm -hmm. It really boils down to how much time do you have to put into it is, is ultimately because every hunter, no matter what you're using, ultimately our goal is to be ethical when it comes to the point of kill. You know, that's we're trying to harvest something, but we as humans are trying to be the most ethical predator out there and we try to hold ourselves to those standards. So if you don't have a lot of time, get a crossbow. There's no shame in that. It that's the biggest, I think the biggest help from a crossbow is not that it's easier to shoot or that it's faster or anything like that. To me, it's, it's that it's easier to get good with. So I feel like if you get a crossbow, if you get it right now and you practice with it for, you know, six, seven, eight, ten 10 days here before we get to October, you're going to be feeling pretty dang comfortable out to 35 yards and you're going to be, you know, what most of us are going to consider an ethical hunter when you go out there. But if you're that same person and you pick up a longbow first time ever, and you think that you're going to spend 10 days between now and October 1st, and you're going to be Byron Ferguson. No, I, you're going to be lucky to even hit a 3D target at 30 yards. And if you don't believe me, come on out to Horseshoe Lake this weekend and I will <laughs> test it out. But um, so, yeah, it, that's what it comes down to. If you love a challenge, you want to get close to nature, you want to get back to your roots, and you want to spend a whole bunch of time flinging arrows, get a longbow or a recurve. And after hundreds and hundreds of hours, that piece of equipment will be an extension of yourself and flinging an arrow will be like throwing a ball and um, but that's a level of mastery that most of us don't have the luxury of getting to so if you're somewhere in between a compound bow is a good in-betweener you know you can shoot it maybe maybe it takes twice as much to feel comfortable with a compound as a as a recurve but it doesn't quite take the hundreds of hours that uh traditional archery equipment takes so there really is a piece of equipment for everybody and there's no shame in any of it the the no. you know the, the people that shoot in long bows they're not turning up their noses at the people shooting crossbows it's mostly the compound archers that for some reason think uh well occasionally some of them i shouldn't say all of them but some of them think that a crossbow is, is a lesser weapon type uh, because you don't have to pull it back. It stays pulled back. Um, I don't know, whatever. Anything that gets people outside in the outdoors, especially in today's world. Is mm -hmm. So yeah, if, if you're within the regulations, right. I could care less. Yeah, yep. sure. For it's sure. all about ethical shots at that point and what you're able to do. And, um, and I can speak from experience. I, I, I can almost echo everything that Curtis has said I've experienced uh, as a crossbow hunter. So uh, when I was 18, uh, I lived in Pennsylvania and they, they legalized crossbows there earlier than Illinois has. At, the, Illinois has been pretty recent. And uh, so um, when I, I was 18, it was September and my dad's like, well, you got money, you can go out and get a compound bow and practice and maybe hunt next year or you can go out and hunt next week and and get a crossbow so i grabbed the crossbow and back then on the rack there's only three crossbows on the rack and now you go to a store i mean there's more crossbows than there are probably compounds in some spots and um so i grabbed one off the rack and then i hung with that until last year and um and and just the the technology upgrades that have come in just those i don't even know guys like 15 years since then no it's less than that anyway but uh 12 years anyway but uh so, but yeah, you can get a, a crossbow now that's in the $300 range and those things are as good as anything else. I mean, those things, you're going to be out shooting my old bow. Um, I mean, the, the speed, the accuracy, and uh, I had peep sights on my bow um, where it was this little circle on the back and a, a little stick in the front. And that's mm -hmm. what I had. I didn't have a, a, a scope on it or anything. And I hung with that for years. And then last year, I finally just said, uh, after shooting the ones from our that we have some, once in a while we take out with us after shooting those I was impressed and I was like I gotta get one of these $300 ones but um <laughs> so uh so yeah so those things work great and uh but yeah again again it goes back to um you still need to get the deer within 30 yards of you I have still even with a crossbow I've not killed a deer farther than 25 yards and um 
And I, I remember I posted a photo on Facebook and a kid that I barely knew from college was like, oh, did you shoot that at 50 yards or something like that? And because I, he's like, what did you like? The first comment was, did you get with a bow or crossbow? And I'm like, crossbow. And then he's like, oh, did you get that at whatever? And I'm just like, no, dude, it was like 20 yards. And then I, yeah, anyway, but. And, and what, what I find interesting is, is, you know, looking at the data last year, it wasn't quite, but I expect this year we're, we're probably going to actually see crossbow harvest overtake compound harvest oh, yeah. in, in Illinois. Last year, I, I, I believe it was like 45%. Uh, so it's pretty darn close now. It, it, it's only trending up. And so I imagine, it, you know, the, the next few years, that's going to even even continue. And it's going to be the, the largest majority of, of hunters will be using a crossbow. And like you said, there's literally nothing wrong with it. And it no. gives you some unique advantages. Like me personally, um, I've, I've been a bow hunter for oof, probably 15 years now or so. A lot of my hunting, especially the past six or seven years, I've, I've shifted. I used to be, I'm going to get in a tree. I'm, I look down upon, you know, deer. I don't want to be on the ground. I have completely shifted my efforts to essentially bow hunting on the ground. And that does come with some difficulties, especially with the vertical bow, you know, your eye level with these animals. So having that big movement of drawing your bow and then having to hold it where, and if you have a crossbow, it's a lot simpler, a lot less movement you have to make on the ground. And so that's a, another question to ask yourself is how do you plan on hunting? Where do you plan on hunting? Do you want to be in elevated trees? Um, then you kind of have a little bit more options if you're on the ground. Um, obviously, like I said, you can do it with vertical bows. I've done it several. I've harvested plenty of deer on the ground with a vertical bow, but a crossbow would certainly make it make it even easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, right now, uh, after shooting around with you guys, I'd be, I'd be interested in getting uh, like a recurve just for practice and just to have fun with. And I don't think I'd ever really hunt with a compound. I'm, I'm so comfortable with a crossbow at this point. Sure. Um, but just get something to, to have a toy almost and just learn the method and everything else. But um, all right, so then uh, crossbows are pretty straight. They make kits now that you can go get. Um, again, they range anywhere from $300, just like a bow. They range in the three dollars to $400 range, go up into thousands of dollars. Um, anything that they make right now is a pretty good product. So you can get what yeah. you're comfortable getting at this point. And uh, the crossbows, you can get kits that come with uh, some a quiver and, and bolts or arrows. And um, make sure you read the specs on your crossbow and, and see what the length of arrow or bolt you use for that and uh, purchase those products uh, as the manufacturer recommends. Um, but going out and looking at a long bow or a vertical bow, uh, what are some things that people might see and uh, some vocabulary words that they might wanna know about a, co a compound bow? Yeah, I, first off, the exact same thing you said about crossbows is true about compounds as well. They uh, met really the past 50 years, the, um, the leaps and bounds that they've taken every few years is nothing short of amazing. And the last 10 or 15 is, is, uh, is no different than that. I mean, I remember back when Matthews was still a solo cam bow, right? Now it's mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. cam, but, uh, that used to be their whole slogan. That was their whole things, slogan. You're right. Things, yeah, everything's changing, but I would say, yeah, if you, you decide deer's your thing, you know, archery is what you need. First decide how much time you have. Once you decide that, now you know what kind of bow you want. The next things that you need to look for are what are your draw length and what, what can you pull? So in Illinois, you, you do have to have a uh, like 35 pounds at a certain inch draw length to be legal, um, but there's a lot of flexibility in that. 40, a 40 pound bow that's shooting a good straight arrow, a good cut on impact broadhead, you can get pass throughs all day long, sticking in the ground on the other side. So uh, you don't have to have a 70 pound bow. That being said, people that are stronger, they may opt for, for more poundage just for a little flatter shooting bow, a little, little quicker to the target, a little bit more energy when it gets to the target. Um, but those are going to be the next two things you got to figure out. Um, you don't need to know your draw length for a crossbow or even the poundage because it's held back for you. But certainly for either a long bow, a recurve, anything traditional or a compound bow, you're going to want to know those two things. And then that's kind of going to adjust what bows you're, you're looking at. A lot of them, like Dan said, are adjustable um, either by draw length by draw weight or a lot of them by both you know you can loosen the limbs loosen the draw weight a little bit and then some of them will actually have different places where you can put the string on the cam uh, to change the draw length um, 
Others like Matthews, for example, you, you can get different cams to change the draw length. And uh, a lot of bows are like that. So um, the, the bow itself may be, let's just say 28 inches, maybe you're a, a 29 and a half, you would have to get the 29 and a half inch uh, cams for that bow, and then it would be uh, the right draw length. But those are the next factors uh, that you need to consider, along with, I guess, the what price point you're looking at. Because the, yeah, the, yeah. Sky's the sky's the limit. You could get a cheap made, uh, really used bows. Nothing wrong with used bows at all. Oh, especially if every bow I've bought different. has been used. Yeah, for sure. Get great deals. You might wind up getting a what was a top of the line bow six or seven years ago for a fraction of what of what a new one would cost, and mm -hmm. really, it's only marginally worse. Uh, you know the. Um, I feel like bows have been really good for a long time. So even yeah. used bows that you get are going to be probably a hundred times better than, than the bow you were talking about, Jason. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then I, I do want to, to clarify just because since you mentioned uh, this draw weight regulation, I kind of recalled in the, the back of my head that they changed it uh, in the past few years. Um, so I, I pulled up the regulation and they did in fact change it. And so currently it's, a long recurve or compound bow with a minimum pull of 30 pounds with a 28 inch draw. And so that's, that's not a ton of draw weight. So most people can probably, and again, the, the nice thing about archery, you're going to be using muscles that you, you don't use on a day-to-day -day basis, especially your back, your shoulders. And so the more you shoot, especially with a long or recurve or a compound, you're really going to, to build up those muscles and you'll be able to increase that draw weight over time to, to get you to a, a place you want to, to be at. And like Curtis said, you don't need to go all the way to the, the top of where your, your bow is. Um, and I think that's for, for multiple reasons. And we've started to see a shift in a lot of the marketing efforts, too, and, and even some product development from some of these companies. You know, the, the past probably 10 years, everybody seemed to be focusing on that, that speed of the arrow, the velocity. How fast is that arrow leaving the bow? Well, that, that's probably not the, you know, the, the, the best metric to, to use. You know, you have to look at penetration. Uh, you want to look at the mass of the arrow. And so we're starting to see a transition to, to heavier arrows, slower or lower draw weights to get a, a little bit less of a speed, but to have more mass in that, that broadhead as well as in the, that arrow. So you really get that, that good impact and gets you really good penetration. Because that's why archery, you know, we, we've hit on practice so much. And so much of it is because there's a lot of room for, for error. Um, obviously, a, a bullet traveling, you know, at a couple thousand feet per second, if it hits a bone, it has the ability to to penetrate and go through that bone and still hit, hit those vitals that, that may be, you know, tucked behind a front shoulder. With archer equipment, there's been a lot of cases where you may hit hit that front shoulder and that arrow may only go in, you know, an, an inch or two and just kind of stick out. And obviously, we want to maximize our, our, you know, humaneness and our ethicalness. And so you want to set get your equipment set up. To, to maximize those odds. And so I personally, um, now that you guys kind of touch base on this too, with my vertical bow, I used to shoot at 65 pounds. I have honestly taken it all the way down below 50. Um, and not only is, is, does that, I think, impact my shooting, but especially with the vertical bow, if you may have to hold that bow back for two minutes, and I promise holding that bow back for two minutes when you have a deer in front of you, it's cold, you're probably tired, you're a little bit shaky because the adrenaline's pumping, it gets quite difficult. Um, and so bringing that, that, that draw weight down just a hair to make you a little bit more comfortable, I think produces a little bit better results because you're able to, to steady yourself a little bit and you're able to, to really maximize your, your accuracy. For sure. Also keep in mind that most people when they target shoot is optimal conditions. You're probably wearing a t-shirt, it's 70 degrees, like you're standing, you're so comfortable. And now all of a sudden you're hunting, maybe you're sitting down or scrunched behind a tree and you're wearing a giant jacket and what you a face a mask. Movie, that's, yeah. yeah, that's Yeah. And so, yeah. And plus there is also most bows do not shoot very well when they're maxed out. When you max them out to the top poundage, that means you're screwing the limbs all the way down. Uh, most of them are going to get a little finicky and that like they won't paper tune correctly. So even if you want it towards the top, it's really best to like max it out and then take it back like a quarter turn or something, just because maxing it out is never a good way to shoot a good, good clean arrow. But it is funny, the ebbs and flows you talk about when we were kids, everybody was talking about lighter arrows, faster mm -hmm. arrows. 
And yeah, they were basically hunters were buying target bows because when you shoot it at a target, it's great. Targets don't move. And then, yeah, they found out that penetration matters and you got to throw a wiffle ball pretty dang hard to kill a deer. <laughs> you know, I, I like that analogy. That's that's good. You want to talk a little bit about um, the different setups and how that might change the path of the arrow. I think Curtis said earlier about how it might uh, you might have a arc or a more of an arch on your shot or it's going to flatten out your shot more. Um, is that something you got to consider when you're taking a shot uh, through uh, woods and, and make sure not, there's no limbs that might not seem like they're in their in your way, but they're actually in your way? For sure. Yeah, there's ballistics to an arrow. It doesn't matter how fast or how slow your bow is. There's going to be an arc and we've all hit a branch that we didn't think was there or maybe you're blind that you didn't think you were going to hit. So like practicing in all those circumstances is key. Don't just practice at your one block target in your nice yard, you know, get in your stand, get in the woods, come out to one of our events at Horseshoe Lake. We're trying to get different shots through trees and and just to get people thinking about that sort of thing because yeah that sucks when you you think you're lined up for the perfect shot you hit the trigger on your release and you hear thwack of your arrow hitting a tree instead of a deer it's it's happened to me i'm sure it's happened to, it happened to me guys. plenty of times yep yep the worst is, is when there's that little limb and you just see your arrow go it, it, the flight looks good and then all of a sudden it just ricochets <laughs> it goes off in yeah, a, it's like another a small direction. little limb so you didn't even it doesn't see take it. much it, it yeah. like disappears when you're focused on the deer and then you know, oh, yep. <laughs> yeah. no but i, I think a, another important aspect of, of of choosing that 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 right equipment is is finding a a reputable brand and finding a, a product that you yourself are comfortable shooting. You can read reviews all day about, Oh, this one is so smooth. I I've read reviews about a lot of the new Matthews bows. I went out to a, a bow range here in town. I shot one. I hated it. I did not like it. It's completely different. You know, a lot of bows are starting to get smaller and smaller. Um, I'm not necessarily a, a big fan of that. It kind of throws off the way I, I like to let the bow follow through. And then the nice thing is archery shops like to let people shoot bows. If you go in there and tell them you're a brand new customer, I'm looking to to purchase my first bow, chances are they're going to roll out the red carpet and let you shoot a lot of different types of bows, let you shoot different brands, different models until you find one that, that you're like, ooh, this feels, this feels good. It, like Curtis said, it feels like an extension of your body. Um, and and that, that, that's a, my probably best advice I could provide to anybody who's looking to, to purchase archery equipment is go to a local pro shop or a local archery shop and just explain the situation. And chances are they're going to let you shoot a lot of different, a lot of different setups. It's like yes, shoe I shopping. Confirm, I used to work <laughs> yeah. at an archery shop and uh, when people came in to shoot bows, that was the funnest thing that we ever got to do because that meant now that was our job just to go back and shoot these bows. We mm -hmm. want to shoot them too, you know? So yeah, like, yeah, yeah uh, not a problem. You want to come in and shoot every bow in the shop? Like we'll do that. Cause once we're done, I probably have to sweep or something. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> <we'll> shoot bows. <laughs> um, it, can you guys, it may be difficult, but um, can you put into words different aspects of a bow that you're looking for and like, kind of like Dan, I'm kind of was talking about more of the feel like it's, it might be hard to think of adjectives right now to, to describe mm -hmm. exactly what you're trying to feel when you're when you're shooting a bow but um what is what are you looking for well we should talk about probably vocabulary you know there's a lot mm -hmm. of vocab words if we're getting into this like um people may not be familiar with like brace height you know like axle to axle measurement I mean uh, even earlier, I said release, a release aid, you know, somebody's new to archery, they may not know what that might be. So that might be a good thing just to kind of put a little definition on all, all that stuff. But um, yeah, when it comes to archery equipment, the, the main uh, phrases you're going to hear, ones I just said, um, if you just pull back the string with your fingers and let it go, Usually that's going to be like a recurve or a long bow, something without a ton of energy. Um, then you're not using a release aid. But when I say release, a release aid is a mechanical device that clips to the string and it holds the string and then it'll have some way to mine as a trigger pull. So it's almost like pulling the trigger of a gun to release it. Some of them are back tension. There's all sorts of different release aids. But most of your compound bows, uh, you're going to have to use a release. There's so much energy. And the 
axle to axle measurement, which is actually like cam to cam measurement, how long the total bow is, um, that's going to determine what the pinch point at the back of your draw is. And most of these have such a short axle to axle, the pinch point is so uh, sharp of an angle, there's no way to even use your fingers if you wanted to. So a release aid or a release is an absolutely mandatory piece of equipment. Um, the, the other part of that equation is then the brace height. So that's the distance between basically the riser where your arrow sits and where the string is when the bow's at rest. So if I can kind of I should have got my bow out, but it's not. But if I can explain that, so your axle to axle measurements, the total length, and then you've got your riser and the string, and the measurement between the riser and the string is your brace height. In general, a lower brace height is going to mean a faster target because more of the string's energy is going into the arrow, but a longer brace height is going to be more forgiving for the exact same reason. Because as soon as you pull the trigger, the arrow's gone. Any movement that you do in your front hand, uh, you're probably not going to notice that with the long brace height, just because the arrow is only being impacted by that for a very short amount of time. So um, those are kind of, I think, the basic vocabulary that we might have missed so far. If I'm missing something, you guys can... Yeah, uh, an, another big one that, that I'll talk about, especially to, to kind of answer Jason's question is the limbs. And you may have mentioned that and I, I just kind of forgot, but the limbs are essentially the, the part of the bow that makes it work. It's what creates the energy. And I, we should kind of warn people, you know, a, a big safety issue with, with archer equipment, especially with bows, is the concept of dry firing. And so as Curtis just described, when you're pulling a bow back, you're creating a lot of energy inside that bow. And that energy has to go somewhere. If there's not an arrow, on that string, when you release that string, that normally that energy is transferred to the arrow as it's released, which propels the arrow forward to your target. If that energy has nowhere to go, it goes directly back into the limbs, back into the, 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 the bow essentially. And it can cause a lot of damage to the bow. Um, in some instances, you can have limbs just basically explode. Again, it is a ton of energy that's just trying to be dissipated by, by the, the bow itself. So if you ever draw a bow back without an arrow on it, um, I recommend being very careful to to not not release it. Yeah, people have gotten injured pretty bad with dry firing bows and them exploding in your face. It's it's yeah. kind of equivalent to uh, shooting a rifle with an obstruction in the barrel. You know, it's sure definitely not something you want to do. But but kind of carrying on to to answer Jason's question a little bit, a few of the things I I personally pay attention to again. About a decade ago, when, when the fast bow movement was happening, you also had kind of this, this silencer effect where every bow was trying to be as quiet as possible. And so they're starting to, to you know, create different products that you can screw into where your stabilizer would go. Um, you can put little inserts between a limb uh, if you have a, a split limb. Um, so there's a, a lot of different kind of techniques to reduce the sound. But what creates that sound is really vibration. And so that's more what I'm paying attention to when I'm first shooting a bow. How does it feel in my hand when I release that arrow? If it feels clunky and kind of rattly, um, you'll you'll immediately know. If you go into an archery pro shop and shoot a three hundred dollar bow versus you know a high end Matthews Hoyt Bowtech, uh, some of these kind of more more high end bows, you're gonna instantly know how how smooth they are just by the the lack of vibration that 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 bow has after you release the arrow. So that's one of the the main things I I pay attention to. Another big one is for me is draw when you're all the way back, you'll feel what we call a let off point. So cams are designed when you're pulling them back, they rotate and hit a point where they essentially will act as a support to hold back the majority of the weight. So the higher end bow you get, you may have a 90% let off. So if you're shooting a 50 pound bow, once you get that bow all the way back to full draw and are holding it, you're only holding 10% of that 50 pounds as opposed to trying to hold back that, that full draw weight. And so that's another thing I, I like to personally look for, because especially hunting on the ground, which is kind of my style, um, there's a lot of times where I'm holding this sucker back for, for quite substantial amount of time. And I, I personally like a bow that allows me to get it back there and have a, a decent amount of let off um, to, to be able to, to hold, that, hold that bow back uh, pretty, pretty long if, if needed. Do you guys know, did... Uh... Uh, there used to be like Pope and Young used to have a thing where they 
limited the amount of lead off that could be a trophy oh. to be counted. I don't know if they ever got rid of that. I can't remember if it was 75 or what it was. Do you remember? Interesting. I, I don't remember that. Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. I'm not. It, it doesn't it surprise me, though. By now, but yeah, I know like a decade ago. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Pope and Young would not let you count a Pope and Young trophy if that's something that matters to you. If you use too high of a let off, maybe that's interesting. Different. I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, do you guys have any other uh, tips or uh, tricks when you're going out and looking for new equipment here? I don't like think so. Said, I think just shoot, try shoot different brands. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So what, what feels best and what fits in your the amount of time you have and in your budget you know go with that and if you practice with it enough you'll get good because even with these mm-hmm. crappy bows like we were talking about when we were kids yeah I had one too one of the cheapest old bears that you could get with the cheapest rest you could get not hardly anything on it. I mean, when you let that thing go, it was like, boing, and like <laughs> you, you could watch the, even at 20 yards, you know, the arrows like a rainbow. But even with that, I got deer. So I, if yep. you have equipment, you practice with it and you get down with it at 20 yards, um, you can be an effective hunter. So you don't have to have the, the top of the line stuff there, but just kind of the lower quality the, that you go, you're going to have to make up for that in practice and or skill you know probably both so uh, Mm -hmm. but there's equipment out there and places for everybody to go and uh yeah hopefully we see a bunch of you out there yeah and i just kind of want to want to follow up on on just kind of my concluding thoughts so to speak price is obviously important it's an important decision that we all have to kind of financially make whenever we're you know purchasing a new product i would say try to stay away from price tag shopping, especially our, on archer equipment. I have shot dozens of different models and makes. And I even, when I went to buy my new bow about four years ago at this point, I went in with the the, the sole purpose of, I'm going to buy the newest top end bow. Um, that was kind of my thing. I, I This was gonna be one of my first big purchases. I wanna, I wanna get the top of the line bow. I went and shot them, I didn't like them, I hated them. I ended up getting a, a five to $600 bow, which is still an expensive purchase, but it's a, a far cry from a, a $1,200 bow that doesn't come with sights, doesn't come with anything else on it, just a, a bare bow. And so don't don't just focus on that price. Obviously, price is important, but definitely, like Curtis said, just shoot, just try different bows. Eventually, you're going to find one that, that fits you and that you really, really feel comfortable with, and, and that's the one to go with. Oh, yeah. One other thing we should probably bring up is people, uh, how to find out your dominant eye, because that's another thing uh, that's kind of important with bow shooting, um, whether you're shooting uh, through a scope, through a, um, uh, you know, for a crossbow, it might be a little bit less important, but especially if you're using a peep sight on a compound or uh, traditional equipment and just shooting instinctively, knowing your dominant eye is important. And an easy way to do that is just stare at the corner of the room and put your hands out in front of you with a tiny little hole in it. Just stare at the corner and bring your hands to your face and your hands will automatically go to your dominant eye. Uh, For most people, if you're right-handed, it's probably your right eye. But for a few people, your left eye might be dominant. And for you, um, you would probably be a better archery shooter if you shot a left-handed bow, even if you're right-handed if you're left eye dominant. So that's one other little aspect that we didn't mention that I just thought of, but would be. No, that's, that's a great out. point. My wife is actually cross eye dominant. And it, you know, when we first started shooting shotguns, I, she's, she just couldn't find the target. I'm like, I, the form looked good. She was tracking the target. Well, she was just always off a little bit. And I was, I cannot figure out what's wrong. So I finally did an eye dominance test. Turns out she's cross eye dominant. She's now switched to shooting everything left-handed, including her archer equipment and shotgun and rifles and handguns, and has improved her accuracy immensely. Now, obviously, it, it did take some getting used to using, you know, your dominant hand, especially if you've shot before. Um, but I, I do recommend uh, thinking about switching if, if you are cross dominant, because in the long run, it will really, really suit you better. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Good thought. Awesome. 
Uh, all right. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, if you have any questions or uh, concerns about archery equipment, you can always email us uh, or Facebook message us. But um, yeah, just go to your pro shops. I mean, that's what they're there for. Help support your local pro shops. Um, there's not as many as there used to be like anything else. But um, if you can find a good one, uh, make make friends with them because they're good people to know. Uh, so that brings us to have good insight too. just mm -hmm. insider tip. They always know when the fish is biting, when the ducks yep. are coming down. <laughs> You know, because everybody's in there and they're talking. So, uh, yeah, make make friends with those folks. They they got yeah. It's they almost a, the new check station, kind of like we were talking about earlier on. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Got to tell your stories to somebody. You bet. You bet. Uh, so now we're going to go over some critter trivia. Uh, so uh, Curtis, you had last week's question with uh, our trap our trapping episode. Uh, so you want to give away the answers to those questions, and then we can go to the next yes, question for yes. this week. Fur, fur bear questions. All right. Yeah. So we had a two-parter. The first part of the question is, what is the largest rodent in North America, which makes it the second largest rodent in the world? And hopefully most everybody knows that that, that is our good buddy, old Castor Canadensis, the beaver. Um Excellent. By the way, if you do get a chance to go out and do some trapping, a lot of people don't think about trapping as being uh, getting stuff to eat, but beaver is one of the best wild games out there that nobody eats. They're available. They're just basically water cows. They fit in a smoker. They're so good. But anyway, the second part of that question was the bonus part is what is Illinois' only native marsupial? Another fur bear, the opossum, old Didelphus virginiana or Didelphus marsupialis, depending on how old your field guide is. I can't remember <laughs> when they did that change, but it'll change back one of these years. So I'll say both names and then this video will always be correct. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> oh. All right, man. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, so uh, for I think for this episode, we may have mentioned this already, but hey, it's going to be one of those where you're paying attention questions. But uh, it's really the only uh, one I can think of that is the legislation on your, your archery equipment, which is going to be your draw length and uh, weight. So what is the legal weight and uh, draw length for a bow to be used for archery hunting in Illinois? Um, so I think we mentioned that earlier. So uh, with yeah, that, I uh, oh, go ahead, Curtis. Oh, I was just saying, yep, Dan said it. He said yep. it earlier. So uh, thanks a lot, guys, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya. See ya. <laughs> cool. Nice.